Excuse me. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Looks like pretty much everyone is here. So I am going to flip over to the doc cam and get things rolling. Of course, this is calc one. Section zero, zero, four. Uh, and today is the ninth. Today we're going to do a few things. We're going to cover section 2.6, which we introduced last time on limits at infinity. <clears throat> and this section, don't get me wrong, it is important. Um, but it's more important in Calc 2 than it is in Calc 1. We, we will use some material from this section a little bit later in the semester. <clears throat> there will be a few places where we'll want to talk about limits like this. Um, but it's not really in the meat of where we're going. And where we're going is the derivative. So I think the section that we're going to introduce that from Take a look at our syllabus here. We are in week three here. Uh, oh, wait, no, that's calc two. You guys are here. So we are in week three here. <clears throat> uh, so we're gonna we're gonna finish up this section two point six that we talked about last week. Um, but then then the majority of the work this week is going to be on introducing the derivative. Unfortunately, we lost Monday <clears throat> and we have this bit of material from last week. Um, so probably we won't get all the way to section 2.8, uh, but I do intend to talk about section 2.7 today. <clears throat> So I'll remind you uh, what we talked about at the end of week last time. Uh, we talked about limits at infinity. <clears throat> so what it means to say uh, that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to some number. So if what it means to say that this limit exists and is equal to some number, <coughs> uh, this means we can make the y values, which are f of x, as close as we want to L. by making x bigger and bigger. <clears throat> Another way of saying this is the line y equals l is a horizontal asymptote for the function f of x. <clears throat> All right, so you say L is the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x if as you wander off to the right on the graph of f, you get closer and closer and closer to L. And if you can get those y values as close to L as you want by going further and further and further to the right, then we say the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to L. <clears throat> we looked at a bunch of examples last time. The main trick was that, <clears throat> excuse me, the renormalization trick. And if there's one thing I need you to remember from this section, it's this. Uh, renormalization is not a technical term from mathematics. It's a term that I'm stealing from physics where you set the speed of light to be one and then you divide through all your calculations to rescale them. Uh, so the renormalization trick here is where you divide top and bottom 
by the largest power of x or your variable, whatever your variable is. Anywhere in the function. Anywhere in the expression. We use this when the limit as x goes to infinity of your thing looks like either infinity over infinity or zero over zero. <clears throat> because remember, infinity over infinity <clears throat> and zero over zero are both what we call indeterminate forms. <clears throat> So we've bumped into these before, taking limits, both zero over zero and infinity over infinity. You'll encounter them often when you're taking limits as x goes to infinity. And the most common trick we'll use is this divide top and bottom by the largest power of x trick that we call the normalization. We did some examples of this last Friday and I invite you to go back and look over those after this lecture. Um, but I'll do just one or two more examples here using that renormalization trick. If I wanted to calculate the limit as x goes to infinity and 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4 <coughs> over maybe, uh, let's say, uh, about 7x cubed plus 3. Right. Uh, here, if I look at this, if I just try to plug in infinity, the top, you'll have like infinity cubed minus infinity squared plus four. The top is definitely going to infinity. If you think about the graph of this function, you know what its end behavior is like. I'm just saying just the top here. Remember from your algebra classes that the end behavior of the polynomial that you see in the numerator here is up on the right <coughs> and down on the left, like just like the x cubed. So this looks like infinity over infinity because the bottom is definitely also going to infinity. So this looks like infinity over infinity. The largest power of x I see anywhere in that expression is x cubed. So we're gonna try dividing top and bottom by x cubed. Sorry, my pen is starting to give me a <clears throat> little bit of trouble there. What does that look like? I take this expression and I divide top and bottom by x cubed then the numerator would be 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4 times 1 over x cubed. And the denominator would be 7x cubed plus 3 times 1 over x cubed. <coughs> and then we distribute. You'll get the limit as x goes to infinity of x cubed times 2x cubed is just 2. Minus 3x squared times 1 over x cubed is 3 times, well, x squared times 1 over x cubed is 1 over x. Plus 4 times 1 over x cubed is just 4 times 1 over x cubed. And downstairs, if I distribute this, I'll get 7 plus 3 times 1 over x cubed. Like so. And then we had that other result from last time, Friday, where we said one over any positive power of x will go to zero as x goes to infinity. When x to infinity, one over x to the p is zero for any powers here that are positive. So if you have a power of x that really belongs downstairs, then as x goes to infinity, that power of x will also go to infinity. So you get one over infinity, which is zero. 
So this is all stuff that we did last time. I'm just trying to remind you. I know it's been a long weekend. Get everybody back into the groove. Then, according to my limit laws, I can take the limit of this stuff and the limit of this stuff separately. This is a constant. It will just go to 2. What does this piece do as x goes to infinity? I get a little bit of participation. What's the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x? Yeah, it's zero, right? The x is going to infinity. One over infinity is zero. What about this? Also zero, right? This piece is going to one over infinity. This piece is going to one over infinity. So the only thing that survives here, I've got two minus three times zero plus four times zero divided by seven plus three times zero. Well, shit, that's just two over seven. And that is the limit here. <clears throat> so this rule you may remember from your algebra classes. You're finding horizontal asymptotes for functions like these, rational functions. If the degree of the top and bottom match, <clears throat> then when you do this renormalization trick, you'll always get out just the lead coefficient of the top over the lead coefficient of the bottom. This is where that rule comes from. But this also works for other things, like if the degree of the bottom is bigger than the degree of the top. This works great. So if I had something like this, and I wanted to send x to infinity, I can again divide top and bottom by the largest power of x occurring anywhere. So the top would be 2x squared plus 1. And then I want to divide top and bottom by x cubed, because that's the largest power of x that occurs anywhere. And downstairs, I would have 4x cubed minus 3x plus 2 times 1 over x cubed. <clears throat> because the largest power of x I see anywhere in this expression is the x cubed, which is right here. That's what I'm dividing top and bottom by. And when we distribute, 2x squared times 1 over x cubed, that's 2 times 1 over x, plus 1 times 1 over x cubed is 1 over x cubed. And then downstairs, 4x cubed times 1 over x cubed, that's 4, minus 3 times x times 1 over x cubed is 1 over x squared. And 2 times 1 over x cubed is 2 times 1 over x cubed. And the same rules lead us to the result here. This piece goes to 0. 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 This piece stays 4. So you get 2 times 0 plus 0 over 4 plus uh, minus, whatever, 3 times 0 plus 2 times 0. This is a, a minus. In any case, the top is 0. The bottom is 4. 0 divided by 4 is 0. So this is your fundamental tool, your main tool for taking limits at infinity. Divide top and bottom by the largest power. There is other stuff though. So let's take a look at one or two other examples. And then we're gonna move away from section 2.6 and start talking about the derivative. So let's grab, let's grab stuff from the text. Section 2.6. 2 6 starts down here. So this is all the stuff that we've talked about. Yeah, that's still really the same trick. We can look at one of those. 
And we should look at one of those. Okay, yeah, we'll do examples uh, four, five, and six. Two x squared plus one over three x minus five. Okay. All right, so this is why I'm gonna need you guys to think along with me. This is new. This is not stuff we talked about last week. Same basic premise, I wanna send x to infinity, but now it's not a rational function that I'm dealing with. It's not the inverse tangent function or e to the x or e to the negative x. It's not any of those special guys. If we imagine plugging in infinity, the top is definitely going to infinity, right? Infinity squared is infinity. Infinity times two is infinity. Infinity plus one is infinity. And the square root of infinity, still infinity. The bottom is also clear going to infinity three times infinity plus five. So, based just on the conversations we've had about limits at infinity, what is your intuition? What might we want to do? Would you multiply by the highest power or would you like multiply the top and the bottom? So I'd like to try that renormalization trick, which is, I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite see who was speaking there, but that's exactly what you said. We wanna try and divide top and bottom by the largest power, just like we did in the, in the previous two examples. The catch here is that your largest power of x is found underneath the square root. And while I definitely can't give the square root to these pieces separately, I can't say this is the square root of 2x squared plus the square root of 1. That never works. What I can do is say, well, this is a quadratic function underneath a square root. So its overall growth should be about the same as a linear function. So the x squared under a square root is like an x. If not for the other shit, it would be exactly x, but there's other shit going on here. So algebraically, it's not equal to x, but the numerator here grows about as fast as x. And this is coming back to something that I think maybe Alan was talking about last week. Alan or Andrew were talking about last week, um, where you're talking about growth rates, kind of who grows faster. So what I'm going to try to do here is divide top and bottom by x. Downstairs, everything is hunky-dory and easy. But upstairs, things are a little bit weird. So I'll have the square root of 2x squared plus 1 times 1 over x. And downstairs, I have 3x plus 5 times 1 over x. Like we said, the algebra in the denominator is not bad at all. It's the algebra in the numerator that is a little bit challenging. So 1 over x times 3x is 3. 1 over x times 5 is just 5 times 1 over x. Upstairs here, though, this piece, I need to insert it into this square root in order for me to distribute and get, get the effect that I want, that kind of renormalization effect, where the top isn't going off to infinity anymore. The way to do that in the top, we treat 1 over x as the square root of 1 over x squared. As long as x is positive, these guys are actually equal to each other. Once you think about that, 1 half is the same as the square root of 1 fourth. All right, 1 fifth is the same as the square root of 1 over 25. And since I'm sending x to plus infinity, I am considering x to be a positive number. So I'm safe to replace this piece by the square root of 1 over x squared. And that's precisely what we do. Mm 
Now that these are both written as square roots, I can put them together as one big square root. Remember when you multiply square roots, that's the same as one big square root with the objects inside being multiplied. And now when we distribute this one over x squared across these terms, we do get a renormalized thing. We get a thing that's not running off to infinity. Sorry, I forgot to write my lemma skate there. So upstairs, I'll have the square root of one over x squared times two x squared, that's just two. And then one times one over x squared is one over x squared. And this we can handle. One over x squared as x goes to infinity, he goes to zero. One over x as x goes to infinity, he goes to zero. So this is the square root of two over three. So take a second, make sure you're comfy. The sneaky thing here is this. Can I ask a question? Um, would it be accessible to treat the radical over uh, x squared on the 2x squared and basically cut that x squared in half to the x, drop the rest of it, and still have the radical 2 over 3 in behavior? So I think you're saying the right sort of things, but we do need to be a little bit more careful than what you're saying suggests. Yes, it's true that the end behavior here is what we're after. The end behavior here is this. But to say that I can just ignore the plus one here and treat this as the square root of two X squared isn't quite correct because this guy does make a difference. And kind of the point of this exercise is to get to a place where you can handle the algebra. So while what you're saying is kind of like says, morally true, right? This numerator really is a lot like two times X or square root of two times X. Um, it's not exactly equal to that. And remember, we can't replace one thing by another thing unless they're actually equal to each other. So while that'll give you an idea for, for what you're shooting for, that'll kind of give you some intuition for where you're going, uh, we do need to be comfortable with this procedure for actually getting there. All right, thank you. Yeah, so it's good. It's really good intuition to have. Um, but then we do need to also be able to make these sort of arguments. All right, so that's the new trick number one. Right? It's really just a modification of the trick we learned last week. The next example we wanted to look at is something a little bit different in spirit. So this is the guy we just did. And I encourage you to, to go through and, and look at this in detail. You should also look at how they handle the limit as x goes to negative infinity, because it's a tiny bit subtle. But what I would prefer to look at next is this guy, because he's a totally new trick. So hold on to this, make sure this is clean in your notes. As we send x to negative infinity, the only difference is this guy and this guy are not actually equal. You'll introduce a, a negative sign here. So I'll let you ponder that and take a look at this next sort of style of these problems. What do we have there? X squared plus one minus X, yeah. So this problem is great because it kind of points out exactly the flaws in the type of reasoning that we want to apply to the previous problem, where we kind of want to ignore the other stuff that's going on under the square root. But if you did that here, then you'd get square root of X squared. Oh, well, that's X minus X. Shouldn't that be zero? And definitely, if we just imagine plugging in, this looks like Well, this piece goes to infinity and this piece goes to infinity. So this looks like infinity minus infinity, which is another one of our indeterminate forms. 
And remember, infinity minus infinity, not necessarily zero, in the same way that infinity over infinity is not necessarily one. So all that this tells us is that we got shit to do, right? We can't just plug in. When we've seen algebra objects shaped like this, like the square root of a minus b, and we needed to do some sort of sneaky algebra maneuvers to take a limit, what sneaky algebra maneuvers did we use? Conjugate. Yeah. So here, I will multiply by the conjugate. Now, if I'm going to multiply by the conjugate upstairs, I have to multiply by the conjugate downstairs as well. So I'll have the square root of x squared plus 1 minus x. And I'm going to multiply this by square root of x squared plus 1 plus x over the square root of x squared plus 1 plus x. So this is the multiply by 1 trick. This is 1. All I've done is multiply the expression by 1. But I'm using a very useful and clever form of the number 1, namely as the conjugate over itself. So they'll get, you get the conjugate of this thing by swapping this sign. If this is a minus, you make it a plus. If this is a plus, you make it a minus. And then you multiply by that upstairs and downstairs. Remember that the original guy is just him over 1. So when you multiply these fractions, you'll multiply them straight across. And also, these are like grouping symbols, so you have to remember to foil the top. I'll do the bottom. I mean, you could make the, uh, like, um, not the assumption, but like, the, um, I don't even know what the word is, but you could just assume, you know, the that graph square root of x squared plus one, that has a slanted asymptote, right? It does, yes. So you could just say that at infinity, it's like, the slanted asymptote, the equation of the slanted asymptote, which would be x. Well, if like you we could assumption, then you're going to get zero out, right? Because then you'd be, that's what I was saying before. So assuming that this behaves exactly the same as x is the same as assuming that this is the constant function zero. And you might be surprised about whether or not that that is actually the case. It might end up working out that way, but there are ways I can modify this problem very subtly that, that, would inc that would allow me to create any real number as the result here. So what you're saying isn't wrong. The asymptotic behavior for this guy is like X. He is asymptotic, very similar to X. His growth rate is the same as the growth rate of X. But whether it's exactly the same as X or not, we need to run through the algebra to see. So for everybody else's sake who may not, may not have learned about slant asymptotes or, or may not quite follow the intuition that Alexander has there, this is how we would crunch this out. We multiply by the conjugate, top and bottom. And upstairs here, we now FOIL. So my firsts are this times this. So that's the square root of x squared plus 1 times the square root of x squared plus 1. That's the square root of x squared plus 1 squared. That's my first. My outers are plus x times the square root of x squared plus 1. My inners are minus x times the square root of x squared plus 1, and those add up to 0. And then my lasts are minus x times plus x. That's minus x squared. So here we are, it looking, looks like we are going to get zero out for this particular guy. Because if you add these two, those are like terms. Plus x root x, plus, sorry, plus x root x squared plus 1, minus x root x squared plus 1. Those add up to zero. And the square root of x squared plus 1 all squared is just x squared plus 1. So here we will get this. And the x squared here and the minus x squared here, they eat each other up. And I like the way you're thinking, Alex. It's good to think in terms of asymptotics, because that really is what we're doing here. 
but if there's one thing I would like to impress upon you and, and anybody else who has that kind of way of thinking about things, it's a wonderful way of thinking about things. It'll serve you really, really well, especially in Calc 2. But keep a check on your intuition. So intuition is beautiful, but sometimes it runs away from us. There's this great saying, I think it was Paul Halmush, that mathematics is like a parking lot. And, um, and rigor, mathematical rigor, that is being very, very careful, doing all of the algebra, that's like a lamppost in the parking lot. If you stay close to the light, everything is very clear and you'll never make any mistakes. You won't get in any trouble. But all the exciting shit happens in the shadows. So you have to be rigorous, stay close to that light and make sure you're being correct. But also don't be afraid to, to use your intuition. I guess the idea is use your intuition, but then verify. So the intuition here is that this behaves a lot like X. So this minus X should tend to zero. And then the way you check that is by going through this procedure. And now we can send X to infinity. Well, what happens here? I'll get one over infinity squared plus one under the square root plus infinity. Infinity squared plus one is definitely infinity. The square root of infinity is definitely infinity. So this is one over infinity. This is zero. But there are easy ways to modify this problem to get other things out. So it's the procedure here that I'm mostly concerned with teaching you guys. Having that intuition is beautiful. If you don't have that intuition yet, it's the process of solving several of these problems that will give you that intuition. So again, if you get an indeterminate form, infinity minus infinity, that's coming from an algebra expression like this, multiply by the conjugate, distribute everything out, then see what happens. In this case, infinity minus infinity was zero, but it is not always zero. Okay. Questions on this or the previous uh, example? Then there's one more problem from this section that I would like to look at before turning you loose on the homework, and it's this guy. Um, the other ones here we have talked about, and the procedure here is kind of neat. So we want to look at the limit. As x approaches 2 from the right of the arctan, or inverse tangent of 1 over x minus 2. We're going to have to lean on something that we remember from last week about the inverse tangent function in order to finish this up, but it gives an example of a, of a, a method here. As x approaches 2 from the right, x minus 2 approaches 0. So the inside of my function here is doing something like one over zero. Oh, well, that's gonna be big, right? That's gonna be like infinity or maybe negative infinity. So in order to sort this out for sure, what we should do is, is look at the graph of one over x minus two. We could also do a variable change. That's where we're going, yeah. Uh, but in order to rationalize or justify that change of variables, oh, let's see, we need to, we need to start up there. We're going to look at the graph. So one, two. One over x minus two is the shifted version of one over x. It's just been shifted to the right by two units. So I'll call this u equals one over x minus two. And this is the x axis. If I approach 2, this is 1, this is 2, from the right, along the graph 1 over x minus 2, you see that he's going up to plus infinity. So as x goes to 2 from the right, 1 over x minus 2 goes to infinity, right, plus infinity. 
So I could rewrite my limit lim x to infinity, or sorry, lim x to infinity, lim x to two plus of the inverse tangent of one over x minus two, using the substitution u equals one over x minus two as lim u to infinity inverse tangent of u. because as x goes to two from the right, one over x minus two goes to infinity. So I call this piece u, and I rewrite it as the limit as u goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of u. So this is the variable change that Alex was referring to. Since x going to 2 from the right means 1 over x minus 2 goes to infinity, my new limit where I use the variable u will be a limit as u goes to infinity. And then 1 over x minus 2, well, that is u. So this is the limit as u goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of u. And we remember what the arctan graph looks like. As you wander out further and further to the right, he gets closer and closer to pi over two. If we were going further and further to the left, he would be getting closer and closer to negative pi over two, but here u is going to plus infinity. So the inverse tangent of u will go to positive pi over two. Here, this would be the u axis and this would be inverse tangent of u. So this variable change thing is a useful tool. And it's the last main tool that we need to introduce in section 2.6. This limit at infinity stuff, we're going to put it down for a while, but then it's going to come back at the end when we talk about integrals and we, we try to pass from Riemann sums to integrals. This will be important again. So work through this portion of the homework. I'm not gonna put a whole lot of problems in here, just a handful, uh, just enough to give you a little bit of practice. And then I'll remind you how this goes when, when we bring it back later in the term. But while we're talking about limits, it makes sense to talk about these limits. Questions on this example? I know this is a little bit tricky. Okay, then we're ready to start talking about the derivative. It's an exciting moment for us. I'm going to introduce the derivative. I see there's something in chat here. Let me address that. The only sort of random page stuff is my favorite websites. Um, yeah, did I have, let's see. Uh, Alejandro, I do. I have, I have a bunch of review material. I think I've posted for you guys a review module in Canvas, although I'll have to take a look here. Oh, no, okay. So I can try to put together a review module. I have them for my Calc 2 classes that I might be able to copy over for you guys. They'll be different. Um, but algebra and trigonometry are definitely the, the prereqs here. And those would be the things I'd have to study. Uh, maybe send me an email, Alejandro. And I can, um, based on what you're saying there, I can try to put together some, some resources for you. Uh, Paul's online notes are very good. So if you wanted a, like a, a go-to... Is 
this algebra and trig review is a good place to begin. Uh, this is just trig. The more general page be here. Um, pretty much everything you'll need is in here. Okay, the derivative, we're ready. The derivative of a function f of x at the number x equals a is the slope of the tangent line. Two f of x at x equals a. And it's defined by two different limits. Um, you can write it as the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. Or you can write it as a limit as h goes to zero, f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. And the notation we have for this, we call this thing f primed of a. So that's f with a little prime notation up here of a. Because soon we're going to study this as a function in its own right. At the moment, I'm just thinking of f primed as being the number that you get out from this limit. It's the derivative of the function at the number x equals a. And the picture here is like this. Here's your function f of x. Here's your number a. The tangent line is the unique line that goes through that point and has the same rate of change as f of x at that point. So the slope of this tangent line is f primed of a. So this might be the most important definition in the whole class. And I'd like to take a second to interpret. Yeah, the apostrophe here, it's actually its own symbol in LaTeX, but it's, it's read as the word prime. So this is F primed of A. We think of this as a rate of change because it's a slope. Remember from your algebra classes that slopes are all rates of change. It's how fast the output is changing with respect to the input. And each of these limits can be thought of as a limit of slopes of secant lines. I'm gonna call this guy one, and I'm gonna call this guy two. And I'm gonna draw a separate picture for one and two that help you see where these limits are coming from. In either case, the result is this thing. The result is the slope of the tangent line. But there's kind of two different ways of thinking about it. When you hear people refer to these, this is the definition of the derivative at a point, And this is usually the definition of the derivative as a function. So picturing the limits. The limit for one, I'll put here, and I'll do my best to draw this picture in a way that is intelligible. 
similar to the picture we have there. Here is your number A. And then I imagine a nearby number X. And the point on the graph associated with him. This is what's called a secant line, remember. We talked about secant lines a little bit at the start of the term. I have a different colored pen here. So we draw the secant line to f of x from a to x. This point up here is a comma f of a. This point here is x comma f of x. So the slope of the secant line is y2 minus y1, that's f of x minus f of a, divided by x2 minus x1, that's x minus a. And if you take the limit as x gets closer and closer and closer to a, do you see how this dotted secant line will turn into a tangent line? So that's precisely what we're doing in this first definition. We're taking this slope and we're sending x closer and closer and closer to a. We're sending this guy over. And really we're doing it from both directions at once, but the picture you can only draw one direction at a time. So as this point gets closer and closer to this point, this secant line gets closer and closer to a tangent line. And in the limit, you get out the slope of the tangent line. The picture for the other guy is very much the same. So the picture for two looks like this. I take my curve and I fix a point A. And then a little bit to the right of that, I imagine some other point whose x value is A plus H. So in other words, I go over H units. The point up here is A comma F of A. And the point here is A plus H comma F of a plus h. So again, if you look at the slope of the secant line, if I were to drag this point closer and closer and closer to this point, then I'll end up with a tangent line, which is what I want. How do I drag this point closer to this point? Well, the distance between them is h. So the slope of the secant line here is y2 minus y1. That's f of a plus h minus f of a over a plus h minus a, x2 minus x1. But that is f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. So you see it's really the same thing. In this case, I'm taking the limit as x goes to a, which has the effect of bringing this point to this point and turning my secant line into a tangent line. In this case, I'm doing the exact same thing, just with different symbols. I have two points on my graph here and here. I want to keep this point fixed and drag this point closer and closer to it. 
Well, here, if this guy has x value a and this has x value a plus h, then sending h to zero will drag this, will drag this point closer and closer to this point. So that's where the two different formulas for the derivative come from. They're really doing the same thing. Both of them are formulas that give you the slope of the tangent line as a limit of slopes of secant lines. Not terribly hard to understand, but it takes a little bit of time and we need to be comfy with the notation. So I wanna take any questions about the connection between these two formulas to these two pictures and how either of, or both of these will give you the slope of a tangent line. Now I'll let you guys think on that for just one second. All right, questions on the relationship between these pictures and these formulas or how these formulas give us slopes of tangents. Anything? <laughs> no? All clear so far. Say that one more time, please. No, all clear. Okay. Yeah, I'll leave just for a second or so. I think I'll have questions like once we get into the examples. Okay, so uh, one little thing before we get into examples here. Just a, just a second more for anybody who's still writing. I wanna talk about how to interpret these things because the, the interpretation is every bit as important as the calculation. You remember from your algebra classes that secant lines like this, they're slopes, we call that an average rate of change, right? Like how much the function has moved up or down as it's moved left or right a certain amount. So the units here, if your output is measuring distance and your input is measuring time, then the units of this object would be distance over time, which is like a speed, miles per hour, feet per second, would be a velocity. So the derivative is measuring some sort of rate of change. And remember the secant lines, these are average rates of change. And what we're doing is we're bringing those two points to overlap. So what you're getting out from this derivative calculation is what's called an instantaneous rate of change. It's not how fast was I driving on average over the whole trip. It's what does my speedometer say right now? That's the main difference. So when you calculate the derivative, it's telling you how fast that function is changing at that point, like right here, at this point, the slope of this line is how fast this point is going up or down right then at that moment, rather than on average, how fast did we go up or down over this interval? So the interpretation of the derivative as a rate of change is hugely important. It's kind of the origin here, right? This stuff all came from Newton thinking about gravity and acceleration. So let's do a little bit of calculation and then let's try a little bit of interpretation, maybe a, a calculation first. Let's find F prime of two, where F of X is equal to, hmm, I'm a 3x squared. 
Now, real quick, I can draw the graph of 3x squared. I know it looks a lot like the graph of x squared. It's just scaled up. And if this is x equals 2 right here, then the y value here is 3 times 2 squared is 12. And f primed of 2 is the slope of this tangent line. So when we do this calculation, what we'll be finding is the slope of this tangent line. Just so we're clear on the picture. All right, let's do it. F primed of two, according to my limit definitions here, I can use either one. I could either evaluate this as the limit as x approaches two of f of x, which is three x squared minus f of a. A here is two, so f of a is three times two squared is three times four is 12, like we said earlier, over x minus a, and again, a here is two. Or we could calculate f primed of two as the limit h goes to zero, f of a plus h, that would be f of two plus h, so that would be three times two plus h squared minus f of a, which is still 12, all over h. So we have a choice. We could calculate the limit either way. You'll get the same number either way. And it's up to us which we would rather do. Sometimes this limit is easier. Sometimes this limit is easier. And it's really just a matter of taste. What would you guys like to do? I'm going to select the one on top. I like the top one here also. I think the top one's a little easier. We can do both. There's a request to do both. So let's do it the top way first. The limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared minus 12 over x minus 2. First thing I see is that I can factor a 3 from the top. And I'll get x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. If I try to plug 2 in, the top and bottom are both 0. So that's, that's no good. So we still need to do something more. What more can we do? Factor. Yeah, x squared minus 4 is x minus 2 times x plus 2. So this is the limit as x approaches 2 of 3 times x minus 2 times x plus 2 all over x minus 2 is the same as x minus 2 times 1. And I can cancel, cancel. And I'll get the limit as x approaches 2 of 3 times x plus 2. Now there is no problem with plugging in 2. The bottom is not 0 anymore because I've canceled that problem factor. And when I plug in 2, this is 2 plus 2 is 4. So I get 3 times 4, which is 12. So the slope of this line is 12. Uh, you can't see my dot there. I guess that's not coming across very well. Yeah, three times four. So this is one way to do the calculation. Come on, pen. I'm gonna switch pens here. Ow. Oh, gee, that hurt. All right. The other option is to calculate this as the limit as h goes to zero of this apparatus, three times. 2 plus h all squared minus 12 over h. This will require the same sort of thing. We're going to have to at some point 
cancel something because we've got to get rid of that H in the bottom. I can't plug in zero for H as long as that's down there. So I'll have to first foil this out. That's two plus H all squared, that's four. Plus two H plus two H is plus four H. Plus H times H is H squared. And then we need to subtract 12 from this and then divide everything down here by H. If I distribute the three, I'll get 12 plus 12 H plus three H squared minus 12 all over H. These two eat each other up. And then I have lim H to zero, 12 H plus three H squared all over H. From here, I still can't plug in my H equals zero because I still have this H downstairs, but now I can factor an H from the top. And now that H that I factored from the top, I can cancel with the H in the bottom. And we get the limit as H goes to zero of 12 plus three H. That's 12 plus three times zero, which is 12, just like we got the other way. Okay. So is everybody with me on these calculations and what they mean for the graph? So the equations are basically, I mean, on the, on the other side of the page, the, like the definitions you gave us, those are basically equations and we're just using them to plug them in to find the limit of the line. I mean, to find the slope of the line. Right. So all we have to do is just plug in. We plug into these. So you take your favorite function X and your favorite number A in its domain. You plug into this and that will tell you the slope of the tangent line to that function at that X value. And there's no, like, we don't get multiple A's. Well, you can use whatever number you want for A. In fact, what we're going to be doing eventually is we're going to find a way to calculate these limits as a function of A. So okay. Every number A in the world, you can find this limit all at once for all of them. And then that will give you a new function. And that new function is called the derivative of the original function. Okay. Thanks. So that's where we're going. But for now, we're going to do one point at a time. All right. Who else would be fun to do while well, we're playing with this stuff? Other important early examples. So we've got our limits. Yes, we've done that one a million times. I don't want to bore you with that. Yeah, we haven't done this yet. I guess we might as well. Right, right. Yeah, okay. So let's find not the slope, but the equation of the tangent line to the function f of x equals one over x at the point two comma one half. So two comma one half is a point on the graph of this function. I want to know what's the equation of the tangent line to this function at this point. In other words, you know what one over X looks like. It looks kind of like this, 
right here is one comma one, and over here is two comma one half. I wanna know what's the equation of this tangent line. Right. So can everybody picture it? This curve is the original, that's F. I wanna find the equation of the tangent line to F at this point, which is two comma one half. So to find the equation of any line, you need two things that the line goes through, and you need the slope of the line. The point we have right here. So all I need is the slope. Any mobile. No. The slope of this tangent line I know comes from the derivative. So to find the slope, we need f primed of two, right? Because the x value I'm working at here is two. And I know that f primed of two is the limit as, I'll do the x to a definition. So this is the limit as x goes to two of f of x minus f of two all over x minus two. And then I'll continue the calculation down here. This is the limit as x goes to 2. f of x is 1 over x. f of 2 is 1 over 2. And so my limit looks like this. Now if I plug in 2 for x, the bottom is 0. The top is also 0, so we got problems. we got to do some algebra. The move, of course, is going to be to have a common denominator upstairs. So I'll multiply this by 2 over 2. I'll multiply this by x over x. And that will get us this, which we can write with the common denominator as two minus x over two x, all divided by x minus two. Everybody with me so far? Take a second, make sure your algebra looks good. Make sure you see where everything comes from. If you have a question, this is a good time to ask. Can you explain the last step with the parentheses, how you got there? So here I've got like two over two X minus X over two X. So these have the same denominator. So I can write it as two minus X over two X. Okay. Like subtracting any two other fractions. Now I'll have this top minus this top over the common bottom. Okay, thank you. So now I can do my flip and multiply business. I'll leave the top alone. That's two minus X over two X. And I'll multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom. That's one over X minus two. I can't quite cancel yet. I don't have any common factors between the top and the bottom. But what can I do? I've got two minus X upstairs. 
downstairs I've got 2x times x minus 2. What can I do with this? Yeah, just factor out a negative one. Good. Yeah, if I pull out a factor of negative one from the top, that'll change the order of the subtraction. 2 minus x is the same as negative x minus 2. And then I can cancel the x minus 2s. So here I'm using the fact, it's an, an algebra fact that is, is useful. It's that a minus b is the negative of b minus a, like this. I'm using it to go from here to here. Now we can cancel these, and I get the limit as x goes to 2 of negative 1 divided by 2x. So as x goes to 2, that's negative 1 over 4. So that's the slope of my line. Is everybody with me on this calculation? So f yeah. of 2 comes out to negative 1 fourth. And f primed of 2 is the slope of the tangent line to f of x at x equals 2. Thus, the tangent line has equation you use your point slope formula. You have a point, the point is two comma one half, and you have a slope, it's negative one fourth. So that's y minus y one, y one here is one half, equals m, that's negative one fourth, times x minus x one, which is two. So this is the equation of the tangent line. And it's just coming from the point slope formula for a line with the point we were given and the slope that we calculated. Remember the, the point slope form of a line in general is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Okay. So the tangent line problem is not terribly hard. Right? Find the equation of the tangent line to this function at this point. You calculate the derivative of the function at that point. Right now, the only way we can do that is using these limit definitions. Later, we will have other tools for that. And then you identify the point. The derivative gives you the slope, and the point is your x1 comma y1. You just throw those into your point slope form of a line and you got yourself a tangent line. I think as long as you've been working through the limit homework pretty diligently, this part of this section will not be that hard. But what can be challenging is the visualization. So I would like to show you some stuff that I've put together in Desmos in the past. Am I logged in here now? Um, oh. Come on, God damn it! Why aren't you working? There we go. All right, now we're in. So, let me see. Where do I have? Yeah, this is a little bit busy, but. Let me turn off the derivative. So just watch this. The purple is the tangent line. This purple point here is the point of tangency. Um, I can turn off any comments about the blue graph. So just watch that line. 
Oh, yeah, we, we, we can see. Uh, we should have the full screen share on here. Let me see. I'll turn it off and turn it back on again. Can you guys see this? Yeah, it's good now. All right. So the purple is the tangent line, and the red is the function that we're looking at. Don't worry about any of the text for now. Just look at the purple and the red. So the tangent line always looks like this. If the tangent line is horizontal, that means the function isn't going up or going down. If the tangent line is sloped positively, that means the function is going up or increasing there. Here, the tangent line is never sloped down. It's always either horizontal or sloped up. But this is what tangent lines look like. So when you're calculating the equation of the tangent line for a function at a point, you're finding this purple line. I'll put links to this in uh, Canvas under the module so you can come in here and play with the graphs. And as we talk more and more about it, I'll have other stuff to show you here. Uh, I think one or two other little guys. Yeah, here's a simpler example. So if you look just at just at the purple and the red, the purple is the tangent line and the red is the function. So if the function, if the tangent line is pointing down has a negative slope, that means the function is decreasing. If the tangent line is pointing up has a positive slope, that means the function is increasing. And the places where you change from being decreasing to increasing or vice versa, those are special places. And those also happen to be places where the tangent line is horizontal. So what we want to start doing is start making connections in your mind between the derivative, the slope of this purple line, and the original function, the red line. If I wanted to graph all of the purple slopes, like I take the slope here, it's negative. I take the slope here, it's negative, but not as negative. Take the slope here, it's negative, but it's really close to zero. I take the slope here, it's zero. What do you think the graph of all of those slopes might look like? It's definitely negative everywhere over here. Definitely positive everywhere over here. And if you start looking for the graph of all of those slopes, it looks like this guy. Let me turn this off for a minute. Turn this off. The green guy here is the graph of all the slopes. You see the green guy is zero where the slope on the red is horizontal. Over here where the red has negative slope, the green is negative. Over here where the red has positive slope, the green is positive. So starting to make those connections, it'll take time, um, will go a long way. But for now, uh, what the hell is this doing? Yeah, for now, just try to picture how the tangent line interacts with the graph. You see that the tangent line kind of just kisses the graph at the point of tangency. And it's got this perfect slope to match the slope of the graph right there at that point. Uh, it seems like for some reason folks are having trouble with the screen share. The screen share is definitely on. Can you guys see what's what's being drawn here in Desmos right now? I can see it. I can see it. Okay, I've gotten a few messages from people saying they can't see. So I'll get out of Desmos. And we'll come back to this and do maybe one or two little, little more examples. Uh -huh. So yeah, I guess it's time to talk about the interpretation here as a rate of change. We mentioned a little bit that these derivatives are rates of change, that they're limits of secant lines. Secant lines are average rates of change.
So I promise this will be the last time I draw this same picture today. But we're going to come in and label things a little bit differently. Again, here I'll take my point A comma F of A. And I'll come over here some distance to X and I've got my point X comma F of X. And we know that the tangent line here is the limit blah, 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 blah. Well, the secant line whose slope I am taking the limit of in order to get my tangent line His slope is made up of a rise over a run. This rise and this run to be specific. There's sometimes a special name given to the rise and given to the run. This rise is a change in Y values. And in mathematics, the symbol we use for change is delta. So that rise, we sometimes call a delta Y. And this run, we call a delta X. So the slope of the secant line, which you know is F of X minus F of A over X minus A, it's Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, can also be thought of as delta Y over delta X. And in the limit, the slope of the tangent line, which you know is the limit as x goes to a, f of x minus f of a over x minus a. This sometimes is written as dy over dx, where the d is kind of the infinitesimally small change. So delta is like a measurable change. And the D here, this is notation used by Gottfried Leibniz um, when, when he first discovered these things, decided to write them this way as a dy over dx, where D stands for differential. Tiny, tiny, tiny little change, right? You've heard the word differential used maybe outside math classes in the world to describe a very, very small change, like a differential in temperature or a differential in time. Here, differential means very small change. Delta Y and Delta X, these are small but measurable changes. DY and DX are what you get in the limit. So DY and DX on their own are called differentials. And to understand them thoroughly, you'll have to take a class on differential geometry. But for us right now, we think of this is the normal change in Y. And we think of this as the differential or tiny, tiny change in Y. And similarly, this is a normal change in X. So this is the differential or tiny, tiny change in X. Thinking of things this way is useful, especially when you, when you get to application problems like physics problems or related rates problems, real world problems, where your function is measuring something like how much water there is in the bathtub or how far you are from your starting position or how far an object has fallen. And your horizontal axis is usually going to be time, like how much time has passed. So here's when you start filling the bathtub, here's like a few seconds later or here's where you drop the objects and here's a few seconds later, or here's when you take off from the starting line and here's a few seconds later. In each of those cases, these rates of change represent physical, real, meaningful things. The slope of the secant line, if you are filling or draining a bathtub, would represent on average how many gallons, the change in Y, you added or removed over how many seconds, the change in X. And the slope of the tangent line 
would represent how quickly water is entering or exiting that tub at that moment. Or if your function is measuring how far you have gone in a race, say you're in a drag car, then delta y would be the distance you've gone and delta x would be the time it took you to cover that distance. So the slope of the secant line would be your average speed over that race. And the tangent line, dy over dx, this limit, would be your exact speed at any given moment. So understanding these things as rates of change, hugely important when it comes to application problems. And there will be a big chunk of this class where we deal with application problems, namely when we talk about two particular sections, related rates and applied optimization. And there will be other settings where we, where we mention applications, but those are the two places where you will deal with units quite a lot. My focus with you guys is on the mathematics, not so much on the applications. The applications are important and we will do plenty of them, but you need to have a firm grasp of the mathematics before you can start working on the applications. The upshot of all this is that if your original function not the upshot of all this, but the most important application here is if your original function, call it s of t, and as s for, for reason naming conventions that come from physics, is measuring an object's position. So I imagine an object moving back and forth along a straight track or falling up and down, moving in one dimensional motion if its position is measured by the function s of t, then the derivative s primed of any particular number has a special name. It's the rate of change of your position, how fast your position is changing over time. That's your velocity. Also, there's a special term for how fast your velocity is changing. V primed, the derivative of velocity, is called acceleration. So these are probably the most important um, bits of application material having to do with a derivative. And this is really where Newton started thinking. He started thinking about what makes things change speed. If you've got something in outer space going, it's moving at a certain speed and nobody's pushing it, then its velocity will stay constant. If you push it though, it'll accelerate. It'll either speed up or slow down depending on how you push it. So the rate of change of your velocity, we call that acceleration. It's how your velocity is changing and it's the derivative of velocity. Just like velocity is the derivative of position. We haven't started studying derivatives as functions. So for now, we just think of this as happening one point at a time. If I ask you, how fast is your position changing at the moment when t is equal to five or three or seven, that's the velocity when t is equal to five or three or seven. And if I ask how fast is your velocity changing at the moment when t is equal to three or five or seven, we call that your acceleration. So this is about all we have time for today, I think. Where are we? Yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the lecture here for today. Next time on Friday, we will do a bunch more of these calculations. I'll try to get us a little bit of experience uh, okay. of these guys. One question. When do you have office hours? So office hours, they're up in Canvas. Monday and Wednesday from 3.30 to 4. Oh, okay. Tuesday and Thursday from 12 to 1.
and Friday from, I think it's one to two. Uh, this afternoon, I do have to go to a doctor okay. at three, so I'm not gonna have an office hour this afternoon. So my next office hour will be tomorrow, Thursday, from 12 to one. All right, other things to be mindful of, if you haven't finished the homework from last week, please wrap that up as fast as you can. Uh, if you need more time, submit an extension request. I've gone through and cleared those once today. I'll go through again once more. And then there is another homework that is going to be opening up later today that will be due next week. All right. So this is where we will. Okay, Ali. So this is where I will leave it for today. Um, please, as soon as you get the chance to get into the homework and start working on some of these derivative calculations and we'll talk more on Friday.